Dave Brock, creator of the Hawkwind legend, yes. which is now 33. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> which now spans 33 years, about 100 albums plus, and uh, about 30 odd personnel changes. Going right back to the start, when you think of Hawkwind, Hawkwind is banks of speakers, audio generators, but going back a bit further to your start, you, you began as a busker. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Take us back to those days in the 60s. Well, I used to do cinema cues and uh, theatre cues in the West End, right. uh, sort of Lyceum. I did, the, I think, when the Pink Floyd played at the Lyceum in 1968, I think it was, somewhere around there. I made quite a lot of money because the queue went all the way down the Strand. It took me two hours doing this queue. Right. <laughs> I lost my voice at the end of it all for singing. Yeah. But yeah, I used to make quite a good living out of it, you know. Um, and you would do busker type songs? For yeah, old blues numbers and right. jazz sort of stuff, you know. That was my next question because the first sort of creation of Hawkwind that was going to be Hawkwind Zoo was Hurry on Sundown, wasn't yeah. it? A demo for that, yeah. uh, which you, you wrote. And that, that is was a very, busking number. That. Yeah, but, but it's got a blues <laughs> format, hasn't it? You yeah. repeat the, the first line twice and stuff. Yeah. So blues was obviously a big part of your formative oh, yeah, years. Yeah. What, what kind of bands were you sort of listening well, to? Well, before that, I used to, I mean, I played, uh, we had a few bands, sort of blues bands and all that. Um, in fact, uh, Mick Vernon on Mediate Records, we got uh, four tracks out on his label, the right. Dharma Blues Band, it was All called, right. uh, with a guy called Mike King, who was a wonderful boogie piano player, right. who uh, learnt from a guy called Pete Johnson, who's one of the great legends, Albert mm -hmm. Ammons, Pete mm -hmm. Johnson, mm -hmm. one of the big legends of boogie right. piano playing. And Mike learned how to play off of him in Canada, and uh, I played with Mike over at Hill Pie Island Jazz Club in Twickenham. With the Dharma Blues Band? With the Dharma Blues Band. So that band. was really your first band? Uh, well, there was other ones before that, but that was the one where we actually sort of things started going on right. from there. You know, right. I played in blues clubs and uh, jazz clubs. Played in a jazz band for a while, banjo, first right. off. That's how I started playing banjo, you know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it sort of progressed from there to busking. Um, and then, you know, it got our going because uh, Don Partridge come along and had his hit single, Rosie. Yeah. So all of a sudden there was loads of guys thinking they were going out on the streets and we used right. to have all these bad scenes with them telling them to fuck off, you know. <laughs> it's, it's my Territory pitch. Wars. Yeah, 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 it was yeah, all that. Yeah. Was, and it got really hectic. And then, um, you know, then I decided to sort of form Hawkwind. Right. Uh, and that's if how we can I, just talk about yeah. that scene, the, the Don Partridge scene, there was actually, you went on a tour together. Oh yeah, yeah, we did Buskers a Buskers tour, tour and a double-decker yeah. bus, yeah. yeah. All over England, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Played at the Albert Hall as well. Right, right. Yeah. And you were part of that, you are a Londoner, aren't you? But you yeah. were part of the Ladbrook scene in the late 60s, which yeah. was, which was a, it was a political scene in certain yeah, ways, yeah. wasn't it? Because it was a, a change, I mean, well, you know, sort of uh, change. Friends, the newspaper friends That's and, right, and, yeah. and anarchist groups, White Panthers. That's right, yeah. How did you sort of, did you gravitate to a scene like that? Or you? Well, most of the guys I knew were working or were involved in all these different sort of situations, you know. Right. I mean, we had so, so many contacts, because it was quite a web of intrigue, you know, Notting Hill Gate in that time, it yeah. was, uh, you know, where everybody lived, um, yeah. We got involved with the bomb squad because of you know our an anarchic sort of situations. We got raids. We're always being stopped. Right. Uh, in our you were raided as well, were you? Yeah. Oh yeah, we stopped all the time. You know, right. I mean, it, it happened for years on end. You know, right. I was blacklisted. I mean, most of the members of the band were blacklisted and always right. being stopped. You know, showing driving licenses. You know, just uh, me and mate to feel that the police knew where we were and what was going on. You know, right. so very annoying. Branded as outlaws from yeah, the start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, we weren't peace-loving hippies. You know, always people always think, oh yeah, we used to take loads of LSD and, you know, we're all peace and love. But we were involved in lots of uh, different things. You know, lots of change we were involved with. Right. Um, Greenpeace, uh, we were involved with them for quite a few years. You know, right, yeah. a lot of gigs we did free. A lot of the money went into sort of different coffers for yeah. revolutionary ideas. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. And with the fir after the Dharma Blues Band, then there was Famous Cure, which actually got yeah. a hit record in Holland, didn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. That uh -huh. was uh, quite strange. Well, um, we went over to Holland. Uh, we actually toured with a big circus tent. The, you know, it was the Rock and Roll Circus. Uh, we were the B band, you know, because uh, they had all the major Dutch bands playing. There was it Golden Earrings, QB and the Blizzards, um, a few other sort of well-known names. Golden Earrings still going, I think. Yeah, 
and um, we're used to sort of just play psychedelic freak out music really you know lots of uh, one notes and one strings <laughs> right <laughs> And uh, that's how I met Nick Turner, because he was working, putting the tent up. That's how right. I actually met him. Uh, and then... Um, Can we focus on that? What was your first impression of this wood, what's going to be a great performance artist and musician in, in the Hawkwind band? How, what was your very first impression of him? What, of Nick? Yeah. Was he the Viking in the sunset? I can't remember him at all, actually, at that point. No, uh, honestly, <laughs> it was just yet another face, because, right. I mean, you know... Um, in the band at the time, we had uh, Mick Slattery, um, John Ellingworth, and we had a Dutch drummer. Right. Um, I mean, we used to hang out in the right places, really, in Amsterdam. I mean, I lived in Amsterdam. Before all of this, I actually went over there and sort of used to go busking in Amsterdam, right. too. I lived there for about four months. This is in 69? This, you know, this was in the sort of about 65. All oh, right. Um, 65 to 67 because there was a lot of rioting going on as well. There was a lot of scenes going on in Holland because uh, it's a long story. Do you want me to go yeah, into all this? I mean? <laughs> I guess it, yeah, it's interesting stuff, yeah. Well, uh, after the war, you know, there's a lot of uh, quislings were in high places you know, in the government and so on. And uh, they, went, they actually kept their places for many years in the Dutch government. And uh, of course, a lot of young people actually found out about this and wanted them sort of taken from power, you know. Right. So. There was a lot of left-wing scenes going on with all the papers, so there's a lot of rioting in the streets, and the police were really quite brutal. They used to right. come in whacking people left, right, and centre. Right. Old men, I've seen old blokes getting knocked to the ground, kicked, yeah. women, kids, the whole sort of thing. And it brought the government down in '67, you know, all the riots. So a big mm -hmm. change happened in mm -hmm. Holland then, you know, um, and we were sort of there at that time. Really. Right. You were attracted to that kind of scene. Was it an inspiration for you in a certain way? Yeah, was it, it was. Well, you were young. You know, what it changed you just things. To be where I mean, the everybody, was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, because you know, you felt like there was a lot of other people who thought the same. You know, you you got to have changed. You can't have right. things being set and staged. You always got to continually. That's why this band's probably forever changing. You know, yeah, because yeah. It, it's a good thing to change, build things up, and then you have to tear them down. Really, right. that's that's right. a good way of uh, law. Really. And when did you start thinking in terms of, whilst you were in Famous Cure, when did you start, there was Group X after that, was that? Well, after the Famous Cure, we came back to uh, England and things fizzled out really, you know. Uh, that's when I sort of went off busking. I mean, mm -hmm. I did work, I was working as a gas board uh, fitter's mate, actually. Right. I used to ride my bicycle off to the, I think Fulham, where I lived, on, on, on my bike to the gas works every right. morning. Oh, God. Uh, I did that for about uh, a year and a half, you know, which was rather tedious. I can imagine, and, the um, freedom of Amsterdam. Yeah, <laughs> and I used to sort of still plonk around on my guitar, and then I decided I'd you know, start playing in the streets and all that, which right. was far better. Uh, which I did, um, and then uh, that's when I sort of actually f I met up with John Harrison because I used to go busking in Tottenham Court Road uh, subway, which used right. to you know run from Charing Cross Road, and I used to play down there because I used to play a lot of blues stuff. And that's how I met John, who was quite an enthusiast. And John Harrison used to play with um, the Joe Lost Band. He was the bass player from Joe <laughs> Lost Band, believe it or not. You know, yeah. I mean, he's a young guy, John was, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and. Uh, you know, we used to talk a lot and he'd, you know, come around and we'd used to go off down to the pub, have a drink and all that. And what uh, kind of blues did you play in that sort of uh, busking situation? Any number that springs to mind, you know? Dealing with the dev, old Sonny Boy Williams and right, stuff. Right. Uh, um, gosh, you know, Snoop Ziegler, I mean, all, all right. these characters. So you were heavily into blues then? Yeah, Sonny Terry Brown and McGee and all mm. this, you know, uh, Muddy Waters, all, all stuff like that, you right. know. Um, then, of course, I met up with John, and we used to sort of sit around my house. He plays bass, so I played his, you know, electric guitar. Right. Uh, and then, sort of, Mick Slattery used to come round, and Mick was sort of like um, a lead, good lead guitarist, mm -hmm. Mick. And um, he used to play a bit like Jimi Hendrix, so we had right. this little thing going, you know. And um, then we put an advert in the uh, Melody Maker, and we got uh, Terry Ollis, mm -hmm. who was uh, working, his dad was a scrap dealer, so he had a scrap yard, and he came and joined up with us. And we used to rehearse uh, in a music shop uh, where I used to live, which was a guy called Bob Kerr, who used to be in the Bonzo Dog Doodah band. Oh, I used yeah. to work with that and the uh, New Bob, Vaudeville band. Yeah, Bob Kerr's Whoopie band. That's it? right, yeah, yeah, still going too. Yeah. I actually <laughs> saw him about two years ago down at Butte Jazz Festival. All right. And um, we used to rehearse in the basement of his music store, you know, which was and on the corner of the street. And that was as Group X? Uh, well, we didn't have a name then, you see. It was right. just like 
a start of a you know the right. band, and uh, which became Group X. We decided to call it Group X, right. you know. Uh, and we used to play around Notting Hill Gate for nothing, and then sort of Nick come along and was sort of, he had a van. And so you'd of, hooked up with him before, and yeah, uh, he turned up in, in London. He turned up in London, and we met up with him, and he uh, worked as our roadie, basically, you know. Right. Um, and then Dick Mick, who I also knew from Richmond, as I've known Dick Mick for quite a few years too, mm -hmm. um, come along. Well, actually, it was a bit later, because Dick Mick didn't have his generator then. He used to help out with our gear, you know. Right. And, um, and then we suddenly discovered that Nick, you know, could play a bit of saxophone. It was like avant-garde, going, blah, blah, you know, and stuff like that. He couldn't play it properly. He could just sort of do runs up yeah. and down, and that was yeah. it. So uh, we decided to ask Nick to come and join us. And right. then, it was, uh, then it was Hawkwind Zoo. We decided to call it Hawkwind was the yeah. idea. It was two names. It was the, uh, the myth mythological name, which was better to be the hawk that flies uh, over the forest than the eagle that flies over the mountain. And the other thing was Hawkwind was Nick Turner's. He was always going <laughs> like this and gobbing, you know. So it was Hawking, <laughs> it was called, you know. And he was all, he also used to fart a lot. He was a terrible guy for farting, you know. So that was the wind. So it was a bit <laughs> so, of a joke. The yeah, hawk wind, you played know. wind instruments. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was sort of part and parcel of how it actually got called that. Yeah. Um, and then Dick Mick joined up with us and got yeah. an audio generator. So that that must have been a crucial sort of stage. Did you have a, a vision of you know what the next two years were going to be? You know, no. the, the, the space rock thing that it developed into. You know, at that time, blues was already on the way out. The blues yeah, boom was yeah. really sort of flagging. And there was kind of like prog rock and, and possibly the starts of a bit of glitter. Did, did when you formed Hawkwind Zoo, you know, could you see the future? Well, no, because we never used to think ahead. I mean, we only <laughs> right. live for now, you know. Yeah. I mean, even so, like exactly the same now. I mean, it, you never know what's going to occur. So you never think, I mean, yeah, we do. Okay, we know we're going to play a few festivals here. There right. now, we know we could do a tour, you know, and so mm -hmm. on. But then it was just like day by day, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we get gigs. Well, we play for nothing all the time, you yeah. see. And the other thing was, we'd actually. Um, well, I never used to turn up sometimes because I make more money busking than I would with the band, you know. Right. And we'd we'd had Doug Smith as our manager then because we got involved with Clearwater Productions. Uh, uh, they had um, this is a guy. Um, Max Taylor. Now, Max Taylor's head of Lloyd's, you know, right. do you know all about it? I'll give you, show you something else later on. Because <laughs> we get all these things in the, in the, um, well, I'll show you later on. <laughs> <laughs> Go off at a tangent. Yeah, right. But there was Max Taylor, um, Wayne Bardell, Doug Smith, and they had a company called Clearwater Productions. Mm. They had a band called Cochise, which, uh, who is it? I can't remember the guy's name. BJ Cole, Sly Guitarist, right. really very famous guy yeah, now. Yeah. Um, they had another band called Skin Alley, um, High Tide, which was quite a very famous mm. band, where Simon House used to play in that. Yeah. BJ Cole's Alabama 3 now, isn't he? He's he might well yeah, be, he's yeah. He's, he Alabama wears horn rimmed glasses. Yeah. They know he's quiet. He must yeah. be about the same age as me. Yeah, he's played, <laughs> he's played slide on Alabama Is 3. Is he? Yeah. Uh, he's a you know, wonderful character. Yeah. Sting. Sting as well. Yeah? yeah? Is that right? right? right. Yeah. Ah. yeah. So, I mean, that's how we actually got involved because we, we, we were playing in, like, like I say, Notting Hill Gate. Psychedelic was all psychedelia going on there, you know. Right. We just used to have a strobe going all the time and Doug Smith had come down and thought, yeah, they sound quite good. We'd get them signed to our little, you know, sort of um, agency and management. Um, and that's how we sort of got started, really, right. in that right. sort of sense, you know. Right. And how did you get the record deal? Uh, well, Douglas got that. I think he did a deal with all the whole of the bands that you had, Cochise, uh, Skin Alley, High Tide and us all got signed to United Artists. Right. Uh, I mean, we were sort of down the bottom of the pile. We were like, right. you know, the boys at the bottom, all the rest of them were all quite good musicians and yeah. <laughs> they were all sort of uh, playing proper places and we used to just play everywhere, you know. Right. So Free um, festivals mainly. That yeah. was part of your philosophy, very much the free yeah. festival well, music is a free thing. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, we were into, you know, all these, like, turning up, playing for free, and people would book halls, get us to play, and proceeds would go to, you know, like, say, Greenpeace or uh, 
anti-vivisection, all this sort of stuff. Right. But we were right. actually uh, floating them, really, you know. Did you know about Nick's performance artist tendencies when you first no, met him? No, Did you no, know <laughs> that no. that was going to come later on? No. Well, that was, I mean, he was, you've got to remember at the time, I mean, people, you, a lot of people used to take lots of LSD and, you know, used to be quite over the top, really. Um, and I mean, we used to look like quite a weird bunch anyway, yeah. you know. Uh, at the time, I suppose, really, as time went on, you know, when Lemmy joined, we were, you know, we were quite an unusual bunch of characters. But before then, there was Bob Calvert. Bob Calvert came along um, probably about 90. He was around, but it, I, he actually started working when I was probably about 72, around right. that time then, you know. Right. Because um, that's when him and me wrote Silver Machine together then, you right. see. Right. Uh, I had to do it under non plume to try and get some money out of the record label, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to do it under another name. Because otherwise they wouldn't have paid you? Well, I refused to actually, uh, I did it under a non plume. I did it under my wife's maiden name at the time, you know. Um, so that um, I would actually get a contract, separate contract, and eventually got the money from United Artists and we got a mortgage on a the house then, you know. So oh, right. actually, how I started stepping up the ladder yeah. of, uh, you know, yeah. in the treadmill. Yeah. And, and that song you wrote as a, an album track, as part of the, it was a live number, it, it was yeah, all I mean, of those things. Yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, uh, you know, well, I mean, Bob and me, uh, over the years, we wrote a lot of stuff together. I mean, we wrote right. uh, quite a few hundred numbers, you know. I mean, yeah. we, d we worked together quite a lot. I mean, Nick was only in the band uh, in the 32 years. He only actually played in Hawker in seven years, you know. Right. Uh, right. That was it. I mean, over the period of years that Bob was sort of in and out doing his own projects, he'd sort yeah. of do West End, he used to do West End shows, write scripts for right. different shows, and he was doing his solo albums, he used to do solo singles. And right. I mean, but you were always open to ideas that would sort yeah. of broaden the platform. So Michael yeah. Warcock, when he appeared at the A40, Ladbroke Grove, you just asked him up on stage. That was always the band's attitude. Yeah, it? well, that was, I mean, when we played, un we used to play under the flyover at Portobello Road, right. under, the, under the flyover there, and um, Michael lived in Notting Hill Gate, and he came down. Of course, we all, I used to read all his books, you know, and he said, wow, you know, it's quite a yeah. great honour to meet him, you know. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you know, do you think uh, I could, um, you know, Nick actually introduced me to Mike, you know, and said, oh, you know, this is Mike Moorcock, and all of us shook hands with him. Yeah. And he said, is it, you know, could I uh, come and recite some poetry on stage, you know? Right. So we said, yeah, it'd be a yeah. great honour. Right. And that's how we got involved with Michael, you know, yeah. and over the years he wrote stuff with us and, right. you know, still right. doing it, he's doing some at the moment. You right. Know. And the Greasy Tuckers album, that was... The Roundhouse. That yeah, was, that, was yeah. The, that, that was where Silver Machine, the that's essential... Right, yeah. Now, how did it get from that to this fabulously mixed single, which it was? I mean, so the production of it was... I it don't know, you know, it's just one of those one of those things that happened, really, you know. It's just fate, right. I think. That's all it was, fate. Right. We just happened to be doing something at the right time for it all just to click in place. Right, right. Uh, I think that's the way with most bands, you know, unless you've got a big company laying loads of money in you and promoting. Right. Most things just occur through fate and things happening, you know. Right. And, coming and, together. and you, you got a lot of radio airplay with it? Did it happen on its own? Was it one of those that, that was just good enough to happen on its own? Do you remember how it... Because well, it got to do the top three, didn't it? it was, yeah, it was I don't know, really. Duty. I mean... It's hard to know, really. It's just one of those things that occurred. Uh, right. I mean, we were like... I mean. Most of our gigs were sold out. I mean, we were, you know, because we used to have a huge, great freak following of, you know, hippies and bohemians and characters like that yeah. coming to see us play. So consequently, places were always full up. So I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of interest in the media, right? Because of what we were doing, and of course, we used to do loads of benefits and all that, you know. Right. Right. Well, here we are. <laughs> Dave, it's 20 minutes since I asked my last question. Unfortunately, an April shower has meant that we've come right into the, the nerve centre and the hub of Hawkwind Operations, your studio here in, in Devon. Yes. And I think my last question went right back to 1970 and the Isle of Wight Festival. You were That's a, right, yeah. You were a sort of fringe act there, weren't you? We were, yeah. We played uh, outside there because of um, the costs, I think. All the big stars have been flown in by helicopter and... Uh, right. <laughs> We played outside. W were you billed as being on the festival? Oh, no, no, yeah. no. I mean, we just turned up there in our old van and right. set our gear up, you know, and right. uh, played, actually had a little generator 
and just played outside. And the silver machine theme began there with Nick Turner painting himself silver? Right? Yeah, well, he <laughs> um, that's where he got noticed, actually. I think it was Jimi Hendrix actually, I think, actually said, I'm going to dedicate this number to the guy with a silver face because he right. had half a silver face then, you know. Right. But I don't think it was anything to do with silver machine at the time. I don't think we'd even written it then, anyway. That right. was in 1970s, a bit later on. <laughs> right, right. And if we sort of move forward to the debut album, were you happy with that album? Was it what, the first one? Yeah, yeah, actually it was very good because we had Dick Taylor from The Pretty Things mm -hmm. sort of uh, was uh, basically keeping an eye on us to make sure we behaved properly. And he was a great help, you know, because yeah. he had a lot of experience in studios. Right. So, um, yeah, he was a great character, Dick. You know, right. he played 12 string actually on some of the tracks as well. Right. And the Hawkwind Act, you know, that involved mime artists, and, and everything that was just coming in, performance artists. When, how did that come together? Um, Stacia, when was she sort of? Stacia, now we met up with Stacia, I think in the 70s actually. Uh, she was working as a petrol pump attendant actually right. in Exeter. Right. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I think we just stopped there to fill up with some petrol on our way down to Cornwall. And um, somewhere we got talking to her and I think Nick invited her to the gig you know right. that we were doing and she ended up there taking her clothes off and dancing you know people used to do a lot of that in the uh, psychedelic <laughs> age of taking their clothes off you know feeling free yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so she was in the band yeah she sort of um, well you know she kept her job for a bit longer I think and then mm -hmm. packed it all up and come and toured with us then for the mm -hmm. next few years and then there was the Roundhouse gig and the Greasy Truckers album. Yeah. And that's really the first turning point. It's got to be, isn't it? Suddenly a band that was in the free festivals yeah. and was in about all the non-business side of things is suddenly in the top 10, in the top three. And the money hassles must have followed pretty soon. The pr pressure on a follow up, that kind of thing. Is it, was that the case? Oh well, Yeah, in a way it did because um well, most of our money we actually invested back into our light show, you see. I mean, we actually weren't making a lot of money individually because we, we always used to sort of plough it back into our gear. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a huge, great PA system with all these fantastic paintings all over. I mean, we had Barney Bubbles. I mean, sort of Barney did a lot of our design work and all that. Right. He's a great artist. You um, always thought in terms of set designs of taking it further yeah, than just a band. It was the... like a, a more of a big community sort of situation, uh, right. you know, like it was a big entourage wherever we went. We had an entourage of people, you know, because yeah. we used to, like I say, we were quite a weird characters, you know, so we'd actually attract lots of weird characters. A lot of them were right nuisances, you know, and <laughs> pain in the asses, but... Uh, you know, it would. It was quite artistic in a sense. You know, I mean, you get a lot of artistic characters, and let's say uh, Tony Carrero, who was a mm -hmm. mime artist, yeah. uh, he come and work with us. Uh, he worked with us again in the uh, 80s when we did the Alric tour. You know, he was Alric. Yeah, was, yeah. You know, in that. Right. Um, and we had quite a few other. We had a couple of girls from America that used to dance. You know, and yeah. we just and sort of. Moorcock, he came along. Yeah, as well. he come along, do yeah. some sort of poems, and yeah. he'd sing with us on albums. Uh, now, did you get, after Silver Machine, did you get the stock record company response? What are you going to do for a follow-up? Um, I don't know. I can't remember much about all of that. <laughs> right. The Urban Gorilla came out. Urban Gorilla yeah, well, came out. Well, that was the one. Urban Gorilla was the follow-up to Silver Machine. And then, of course, uh, unfortunately, you know, the IRA were on a bombing campaign and sort of, obviously, uh, EM, uh, well, United Artists, I should say, not EMI. But uh, UA really thought that, you know, because of the words of the song, which is totally relevant now, I think I said that in the uh, record collector, you know, they are totally relevant. So, right. I mean, the stuff that Bob was writing, nothing's changed. Look mm -hmm. at what's going on in Palestine. Oh, I won't go on, but I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> no, do. we're talking about 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, the same things have been occurring, like the First World War, you know, that happened yes. in, in yeah. Sarajevo with the first right. assassination. Yeah. That's how yeah. that started. Yeah. And nothing's really changed. You know, you think the same things are occurring. Like a cycle, isn't it? Right, yeah. You've got, uh, you know, the Arabs getting their own land back and now you've got Israel and yeah. it's, nothing's changed. Right. Unfortunately, we don't, the human beings don't have that sort of... Uh, Perspective. To, to actually change, you know, they mm. get bigger weapons and... But anyway, I won't <laughs> go on, so... <laughs> but the, the upshot of it was about Urban Guerrilla, the upshot of it was yeah. that United Artists wanted to withdraw it just when you had a good 
We had Sing, a good single, single good word. Well yeah, it would have it would have gone up into the top ten. You know, right. we hired our profile, and then the, you know things would have gone on. We probably would have you know, ended up being one of the big, big sort of superstar bands. Who knows? Right, right. Consequently, you know, things didn't work out like that. So. Yeah, yeah, that must have been a great disappointment in a way. I don't right? think it bothered us. We were a bit cross at the time, but you know, we weren't that sort of too. We weren't phased by all the things that used to go on because. We used to live day by day, you know. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't people, you know, would say it's a career, but it wasn't a career. I don't regard playing music as a a career. It's it's like a pleasurable sort of thing. I mean, it's our work because you've got right. to practice, but yeah. it's it's different, you know. It's like yeah. being an artist. You paint pictures. You wouldn't say, yeah, you know, it's a career. Yeah. It's not like sort of working at the gas board like I used to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What are your first memories of Lemmy? Um, Lemmy. Um, first memories of Lemmy. <laughs> well, he didn't have a bass actually to start with. <laughs> right. We had, uh, I think we gave him a bass because he didn't have one. Uh, mm -hmm. We had this old bass, and uh, Lemmy ended up playing that. Um, and then he sort of progressed from there onwards. You know. Right. Right. Uh, I think it was Dick Mick, actually. I mean, we were having trouble. We had uh, Dave Anderson, who was uh, the bass player for Ammon Duel, playing with us then. Mm -hmm. um, and Dave was sort of on a different scale from us. I mean, he, you know, he had a sports car. He lived a bit of a different lifestyle, you know, because we were pretty, you know, all hard up all the time. Right. Um, so there was that little bit of sort of resentment, you know, of not being one of us syndrome with him. So he right. was given the elbow, and then he came and joined up with us, you know. Right. And, and he, he had a big, a lot of exposure for Silver Machine, didn't he? he yeah, let me. He ended up singing it. Ended, we all tried it, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and let me ended up best. singing it. So, may, you know, that was the start of it all, maybe. You know, you never know. It's right. fate. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, let me, you know, everything was 100% for, for the band, you know. Right. For the good right. of uh, United. We were, it's like a united front. Right. I mean, you know, in this business we're in, it's people are always trying to divide you all the time. Right. You get a united band, you get someone ear rolling, somebody else, you know. And that's how it ended up years later. People stabbing each other in the back, trying to get rid of him because right. he's not playing properly. But yeah. anyway, that's later. Yeah. But, but uh, even so, Lemmy, looking back, remembers that there was a bit of jealousy from certain parts of the band, that the exposure that he got for, for Silver Machine. Do you remember it being like that? No, not really. No, no. I, no, you know, it didn't really bother us that much. I mean, right. I mean, him and me used to get on really well because, I mean, you know, we used to play very well together. I mean, we were sort of, you know, very close. Right. right. So, I mean, it was me who had to go and tell him yeah. that his days were numbered. Well, his day was numbered, you know, because nobody else wanted to do it, and I was real, real close. Very sad. Right. Sad day. Right. But before that came all the yeah. sort of difficulties about the fact that, basically, putting it simply. The rest of you were acid freaks, and, and here we had and a Dick speed freak. used to take loads of speed, so we'd be all, you know. <laughs> the two did not. It used to call problems. Merge. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, the well, everybody used to take their different things, and it wasn't like that. Sometimes it was bad tempers and you know crotchety, you know. Right. All these little things that used to become mountains, really. You know, they're very small, really. Right. But as time goes on, they become quite, you know, mountains, and people get resentful. Right. Lemmy and Nick didn't get on very well, you know. And Nick, Nick used to play continuously through vocals on his saxophone in the wrong key. You know, I, th I threw a can of beer at him on the head one night on stage. You know, really used to piss us off, you know. We used to tell him, make sure you stop playing when we're doing the vocals. You know, okay, right. But vocals. it was the jazz. It was a jazz man's attitude, was it? The modern jazz attitude. Well, that you a bit can... of an ego thing, you know. He had, <laughs> right. he had a bit of a problem because as, as as we become more famous, his ego become even bigger. You know, I mean, yeah. this is what goes on in this business. You know, me. You know, don't talk as we. It becomes I. When I decided, right. <laughs> instead of when we decided, you right. know. And so consequently, you know, you get a lot of resentment. And uh, but as yeah. you were saying, the band was from about 72 to 74 was, to all intents and purposes, a band it going on. United, you know, and, and there yeah. were big shows, Space Ritual, yeah. live and things. Yeah. You were suddenly, say, doing tours in America where you're pe playing 8,000, 12,000 yeah. seaters and you've got bands supporting you. Yeah. Again, sort of contrasting that with where you came from only four yeah. years yeah. earlier, the free festivals, yeah. 
the fringe events, etc. Did you feel comfortable in that kind of venue? Um, well, it was quite, uh, yeah, I mean, you accommodate it. I mean, okay, it's a bit nerve wracking, you know, I mean, it's like everything's taken care of. You, you know, you're living in the false world of the rock business, you know, where you've got your roadies. You know, I never used to attach my guitar, I think it was tuned up, you know, and you go on stage, you know what goes on in this yeah. business, and yeah. it's quite strange, really. Uh, living a high lifestyle of uh, anything we wanted we can have. I mean, we stayed in the, in the Hilton in Detroit with uh, Joe Walsh and the Eagles were staying there. We were staying there. It was Man, um, Funkadelic, I think. All these bands were staying. It was like a madhouse, you know, loads of girls <laughs> running around everywhere, <laughs> loads of drugs. <laughs> I mean, it was like a really strange place to be in. I mean, Christ. <laughs> but you took it day by day as yeah, you, you Yeah, we just go on, you know, yeah. on to the next one and, right. you know. But then in the mid 70s, in a very short space of time, you, you lost Lemmy yeah. and, and Nick Turner. Now that's got to be quite a sort of change yeah. in the band's outlook. How did you get over that sort of rocky phase? Well, I mean, with the Lemmy syndrome, it was difficult because he was very important to the band. You know, he's one of the great wills, really, you know. And uh, when he went, we had Paul Rudolph, because um, uh, he used to play in the Pink Fairies. I mean, both Pink Fairies and Hawkwind used to always be doing the free festivals together. I mean, they were the mm -hmm. two bands that used to do most of the festivals. Yeah, right. um, consequently, you know, Nick was, you know, a big buddy of Paul Rudolph's and all that. So, I mean, consequently, he wanted Paul in the band sort of thing, you know. Right. Um, and then the sound changed. It went sort of funky in, like, 76, you know, mm -hmm. that album that we released then was sort of funky. I didn't like that. You know, sort of which sound. album we um, amazing sounds, sounds like, um, right, right, yeah. that one. Um, you know, I didn't really like it. I was much more spacey into more electronics and you know, good sort of heavy rock chords and stuff like that, rather right. than being all you know, funky and all that. So that and was that bit. Quite soon after that, you moved from United Artists as well, and yeah. then, then, then there was that weird phase where you lost the rights to the name for a while. Yeah, well, it was a lot of strange things going on, really, you know, because uh, we'd done a tour of America, Bob had freaked out. I mean, we, do, we did a tour of Europe, um, whereas Bob was really on form over there, you know, and he was really fantastic, really. Hard to explain, Bob used to suffer from mental problems, really, right. which was a real shame. He was genius, you know, and so consequently he'd be really down for maybe a few months and really high. He used to, you know, have to right. take sort of tablets to try and mid him, him out, really, yeah. you know. So um, at that point we were signed to Charisma then, I think mm -hmm. it was. We actually uh, signed to Charisma for uh, three years. Um, and then we did a tour of America, which uh, was Simon, we had Simon House playing with us. Uh, well, he'd been playing with us for about the past five years. Right. <laughs> and he got a chance of joining up with David Bowie in America, which he took, because obviously it was a lot more money and the band was on a bit of decline. Everybody was really worried about Bob because he was on a downer, you know, he right. was standing on stage like this and he could, you know, really affect all the rest of the band because he was the front man and he was, yeah. you know, and we were all sort of feeling down with him, you know. Oh dear. Uh, that's when it all really come to a stop in 1977. That's when I sold my guitar to this guy, you know, that had been a fan for years. Uh, in fact, I gave up. I did Adrian Shaw, I, I didn't see Adrian Shaw for about 10 years after that, finished the tour in uh, San Francisco. Right. And um, I saw him walking down the street. I never saw him again for 10 years. And I mean, I sold my guitar. We we're really on a low point, you know, right. where it was like, say, Bob, uh, came back to England and went into a mental institution, you know. Right. Um, so that looked like the end, yeah, as yeah. it were, you know. And, and there you was also this, lost your name. Yeah, it was a contractual thing, you know, with charisma and all that. And we had a bit of a argy bargy about that. And we decided to, Bob and me, decided to do Metropolis and do it as the Hawk Lords, you know. That was the next right. grand scheme that we had. And so we started writing the next stage show, which was Metropolis, you know, doing right. a show on the road with six dancers and this big sort of um, scaffolding and all the works, you know, which is quite a big thing to take on the road. And that's, right. then we did that for a year. Uh, and then we just, you know, went back to being a Hawkwind again because it all sort of uh, calmed, calmed down, down a bit and yeah. all legal things were all sorted out and uh, we off we went, you know. Right. <laughs> and then the next project uh, was, well, very soon afterwards, uh, involved Ginger Baker with the Levitation album. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That was uh, when Simon, unfortunately Simon King, um, had a bit of a drug problem and he couldn't keep it together anymore, you know, which is a real shame. 
I mean, yet you see, you get very close to. I mean, you think a lot of the guys, even now. I mean, we know each of us knows uh, our characters and right. uh, more than your wife would, you know, because you know true characters. You see yeah. people freaking out. I mean, tantrums. You know, all the whole sort yeah. of works, and you do get very close. You know, there's a big camaraderie in yeah. the band. And with Simon, it was very sad because, like I say, he had a drug problem and he couldn't keep it together. And um, Marianne, Hugh Lloyd Langter's uh, uh, wife, was managing Ginger at the time. And uh, she said, well, why don't we get Ginger Baker to come and play drums? Because we were in the middle of recording an album at the Roundhouse yeah. Studios because yeah. we had signed a deal with Bronze Records. Right. And um, we said, yeah. And I mean, it's quiet. I thought, Christ, Ginger Baker, you know, like he's one of the world's great drummers. And we were all sort of quite nervous. Yeah about meeting him and having playing with him, you know, because uh, of this great reputation. So Ginger came down, great character, you know. Bit of a grouchy guy he is, you know, <laughs> Ginger is. Crotchety. Yeah, very crotchety, but, uh, you know, he's all right. Though, yeah. you know, he's but you liked his drumming enough that Simon oh, yeah. had put down some tracks prior to that and yeah. you actually asked Ginger Baker to, That's right, to, yeah. to redo those redo as well. Yeah. And we did all that, which he did really easily, you know, yeah. and got it all together and then he joined us for a year and um, that's how it went on. Yeah. yeah, but listening to that album, Levitation, yeah. that also, sort of maybe the benefit of hindsight, but it also marked quite a, a journey away from the space rock. It was, it sounds a bit more American rock yeah, in, yeah, its, in its feel, so, you know, yeah. so were you happy about that? I don't know, I haven't listened to any of these things for years. Right. I never listened to, once we've done uh, albums, I'll, I'll go on to something else, you know. Yeah. I never very rarely ever listen to old stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Richard quite often says, oh, you ought to listen to some of these old tracks, get yeah. an idea again. I said, well, not really, I'm not trying to get back there again, you know, yeah. just carry on. Yeah. So maybe uh, then, like with Bronze, we were signed to Bronze, who was, you know, trying to hire our profile, getting us into the progressive rock, you know, good boys right. side of things, you know. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, you're right and, and in the, saying that, yeah. The Ginger Baker thing was always seen to be something temporary, was it? Was it? Uh, yeah, or I were think you hoping, so. Behind, you know, were you hoping that perhaps this might... Well, it was quite weird because Harvey and Ginger uh, didn't get on too well because Ginger really wanted, uh, I think at some point or other, he wanted Jack Bruce to play with us because uh, we'd done a TV show in Germany and they met up and well, Jack and Ginger had been at Loggerheads for years and um, Jack was doing this TV show as well and uh, everybody thought they were going to fight each other when they saw each other and they suddenly put their arms around each other and shook hands and they actually did a jam on this TV show. Right. And then I think Ginger had mentioned maybe trying to get Jack to come and play instead of Harvey, you know, and right. he'd had a meeting with everybody in the band and, um, you know, said, look, we're going to get rid of Harvey, which uh, Harvey was a mate of mine who I couldn't do anything so bad as to stab him in the back and get rid of him. I said, no, sorry, Ginger, you're the one who's going. Right, you know? right. <laughs> so Ginger went, oh, bollocks then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the last time I saw Ginger, it was uh, all his gear was being loaded into Kingsley Ward, who owns uh, Rockfield Stone, into his horse box. And Ginger's <laughs> drums are being driven away in the horse box, you know. And I didn't see Ginger at all after that. That was the end of it all, you know. Right, right. And going on to about the mid '80s and Chronicle of the Black Sword. Yeah. Now that was a big show as well. Yeah. yeah. Can you, just as a way of how you bring your shows and your music together, can you take us through how that, well, what it was all about, how you brought in the writers, the theme of it? You know. The well, the idea was with that, which is Elric, which is the uh, Storm Ring. It's about a sword, just like computers, you know, sucking the soul. Computers suck your soul away, and now that's the idea. This is our latest project at the moment. It's very similar. Uh, Michael Moorcock had written this uh, five uh, book series about Alric at Stormbring, an albino warrior uh, who had this sword. Very wonderful stories, actually. And we thought, wow, perhaps we should have a go at doing this on stage. So we asked Michael, could we do this? You know, yeah, you know, any help you need, go ahead and do it. So I read all the books and actually brought it down to sort of one book, as it were, cause, so we could do it as a stage show. Uh, we got in touch with Tony Carrera, uh, mm -hmm. mime artist, who used to work with us in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, Chris, my girlfriend, was Zara Zinia, you know, as a uh, princess in the story. Um, we all wrote, sort of, all of us wrote together, you know, this, uh, a lot of this, the words and the music and so on, you know, as a big sort of 
presentation and uh, off we went on tour with it really you know. right, took right. a lot of doing i tell you, you how, how long about you talking about to get a show like that a year from, yeah. a year a year to get it together and then you take and it and then on. sort of take it on the road and right. it last maybe it lasted about two years on the road i think and uh, in about 85 there was the first hawkwind convention that's right in your uh, fans, manchester yeah. your fans are got to be compared to sort of like deadheads and the grateful dead they are a very loyal yeah bunch of people I've got all that on video actually funnily enough down in there the 85 that door and there's loads of videos <laughs> of that convention <laughs> there's a video of that whole convention yeah right was, uh, quite strange yeah it was quite interesting quite hectic uh, sort of there for about six hours you know sort of right. giving talks and various members of the band there signing stuff loads of stuff you know mm -hmm. quite interesting never done that before right and in a, in a certain way also your know, next bass player came as a fan Alan yeah, Alan Davey, yeah. He'd been writing to us saying that uh, he was the man for the band. Because <laughs> um, he used to sort of write these letters and send us a tape. So we decided, you know, to get him to come down and play. And, you know, he, he got the part. And also Danny Thompson, which was his buddy. Danny ended up playing drums on the Elric tour, you know. And then there was that one incident where your two sort of primary writers within the band Michael Moorcock and Bob Calvert ended up having a fight backstage. A skirmish, well, the side of the stage, yeah, but that was in, uh, I think, 1987, 86, 87, uh, at the Rainbow, where we were doing a show, um, when um, they had a bit of a skirmish, because uh, Bob was going out with, well, Michael, I think it was in the middle of a divorce, I don't know, I can't remember, actually, I need a prompt on these things, because I can't remember exactly what it was going on then, but... <laughs> something was going on and i'd sort of bob was on stage doing the vocal and he was going to go off and michael was going to come on and do his uh poem and i sort of playing away there and i looked across the side of the stage and saw bob go off and all of a sudden they started having a struggle and a fight with all people trying to separate them you know oh, christ you know we went on and on thinking well you know and then bob come on and took the microphone and carried on in fact he was doing this very number here called Time for Sale, I might add, folks. <laughs> well, this was the Just song. <laughs> and sadly, in 1988, he, he died. He yeah, died. great, great shame that. Sorely um, missed, because we had actually started on a new project together called The Earth Ritual, which uh, we were going to do a big stage show, you know, going back to the Earth was the whole idea, because the other one was uh, Space Ritual, going off into space. This one, you know, was sort of all about the Earth and interesting. Right. And we actually did, uh, I think we did um, an EP actually, uh, it came on Flick Knife Records, I think, wasn't it, mm -hmm. called The Earth mm -hmm. Ritual Preview. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think Lemmy played on that too, as right. far as I remember. Right. Uh, yeah, sad. Yeah. Now, one of the sort of things about uh, Hawkwind that has happened many times, I think it's, it's a great compliment that, say, someone like Johnny Rotten came into your dressing room in the late 70s and said, it's because of you guys that, you know, we're mm. doing punk. Yeah, well, uh, that's right. I and if you listen, you know, to tracks like Brainstorm, there's a big kind of punk, yeah, proto-punk yeah. influence there. Yeah. And in the early 90s, in the early 90s with Space Bandit and Electric TP, you're very much going, you, your name started being Hawkwind and Techno. Mm. That kind of link was well, made. Well, it's, I don't, because of what we play over the years, I mean, it's like Death Trap. I mean, all these numbers are straight, sort of good, sort of hard, sort of rocky numbers that, uh, and and the electronic side of uh, music being very hypnotic, trancey. Yeah. I mean, we've never stopped playing. We've been doing this sort of music for years. Yeah. Like Opelika, if you listen to Opelika from uh, 1974, I think it is. Uh, it's just sort of very straight bass and drum sort of. In fact, mm -hmm. I played the bass on that, believe it or not, folks. Actually, I. <laughs> <laughs> Lemmy was asleep. He's been up for about four nights on the trot. <laughs> he never played it, I played it. But um, stuff like that, which really is, it, it doesn't date, you know, it still yeah. sounds in vogue now. Yeah. I mean, so really, uh, what we're doing now with Richard, I mean, Richard's been in the band since 1988. I mean, Richard's really into sort of doing lots of uh, weird techno stuff, mm -hmm. which he does. Um, I mean, I suppose really we just sort of carry on as we are, you know, we haven't really changed that much. We're still space rock, right. as it were, but the influences, uh, we influence a lot of bands around us maybe, you know. Right, right. 
And you were basically down to a trio. That was the 90s. You went that into the 90s, the 90s as, yeah. as a trio, yeah. Yeah. And, and that remains to this day, really, yeah? Well, yeah, we had a go. I mean, it was hard work doing a, uh, being a trio. You know, we did Electric TP and uh, Business of the Future. Um, what else did we do? I think we did another one, didn't we, as a trio? But it was hard going on stage, you know, three people. You, you know, we had all our keyboards on automatic pilot and stuff like that. So um, it was quite hard work. You know, right. it was nice to get a few more people back in the band to take the pressure off, you know. <laughs> that's for, for gigs, yeah. That's yeah. And, and who are the pe people in concern? What, now? Yeah. Um, well, we've got Simon House uh, playing with us again. Uh, we've got Hugh Lloyd Langton playing lead guitar with us. Right. Uh, we have Tim Blake, who used to sort of play with Gong, you know, and work with us in the 70s, of course, 79, 80, on the Levitation album and all right. that. Uh, he's a good friend of ours, lives in Brittany, and he's working with us too. So, I mean, we're still sort of you know doing our cycle <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the mainstay is you know like like i say is alan and richard i mean they are sort of the mainstay a driving force really you know for quite a few years right. um i mean they never get much credit for it because people always mention you know go back oh yeah you know you know what i mean yeah. oh yes in the 70s and so on but i mean alan's bass playing he's a good pokey bass player you know and right. Rich is a real good drummer yeah. and they've been like the engine room for this band for the past 14 years so and on your 30th anniversary you didn't have Stacia but you had Sam we had Fox. Sam Fox yeah I know great eh <laughs> <laughs> was that a pleasant experience for the band <laughs> well yeah she's really lovely Sam is you know mm. we really like her because she did uh, Give Me Shelter because Richard sung the song Give Me Shelter with mm -hmm. Sam you know when mm. we did that for the homeless um, because all the proceeds went to charity for that. And that's how we got in. Sam actually asked, when they actually asked, what band would you like to work with? And she said, well, I'd love to work with Hawkwin. And then mm. that's we got her agent phone us up and say, look, Sam, I'd like to do this number with you. And we had to learn how to play Give Me Shelter and all that. So that's how that all got involved. And she came down here, just where we are now, and recorded it, you know, got it all together. Right. And right. that was it. Right. For just a general general thing before we finish, and thanks very much for so much time, um, you, Hawkwind, have used acid to the benefit of the music. Has this always been the case? What, you mean now? <laughs> or just generally, just going back to 30 years, years ago, yeah. I mean, it was always, it's, I suppose, really, um, you have to be careful with all drugs. I mean, you know, drugs can be abused really quite easily. Um, especially in the rock and roll business because you know you know yourself I mean there's plenty of them around if you want it you can mm. get it you know mm. but you I think uh, in the 70s it was treated more as a, a, a special thing you know where you'd have like gurus I mean when people started taking LSD they always had characters who wouldn't take it who, who could help you along the road when things got a bit dodgy you know mm -hmm. Uh, so consequently, you know, it's not so much now people just take it as a sideline, have a good fun on it, but I right. think it was more spiritual then, you know. Yeah, yeah. So consequently, um, then there was a lot more sort of spiritualistic sort of meaning to drugs than there are now, really, you know. Right, so Times much have changed. It's linked to dance, it's dance culture. Yeah, and, and, it's yeah. more fun, you yeah. see. I mean, you know, uh, maybe, uh, probably not as strong. I mean, we were taking LSD that was really strong. I mean, you know, everything used to melt and all sorts of things used to happen. And you used to freak out. I mean, you used to, you used to push yourself to the extreme to see how much, you, how far you could go. You right. know, your little voice saying you're going to go mad in a minute. And, On stage. Yeah, and off, you know. <laughs> and yeah. then you go and see if you could, you know, and sometimes uh, some people would never come back and they would be mad you know it's mm -hmm. dangerous mm -hmm. uh, these are the, and that's why you need people around you know to help right. so and got to be careful luckily there was that always within your entourage yeah i mean we used to be naughty and take it just for the fun of it and go nutty and <laughs> take yeah. mixtures of things you shouldn't you know but and it sometimes yeah. not always did it help the music you were saying earlier about a drummer who who was uh, not into acid but was into coke and and uh, oh yeah and he had, his uh, timing was timing went up the creek and it'd be one day it'd be up next day it'd be down you know it'd be awful on stage you know things would be slowing down you know and other days i'd be going faster <laughs> and faster 
I mean, it's the same with all these things, you know, you, and apart from that, you still got to remember you're playing to an audience that are paying to come and see you. They don't want to see you a wreck, you know, <laughs> can't get it together, though it might be fun sometimes, because, I mean, as you know, lots of characters in this business do take them and go nutty on stage. It looks great, yeah. someone going mad, you know, if, it's all right if the cameras are there, but they can't do it every night, you know, else you conk out. Dave Brock, Captain Hawkwind, thank you very much for your oh, time. Oh, thank you very much too. Ha, ha, ha.